Welcome to The Threat to Democracy, Defeating Cancel Culture by Defending the Values of the Free World. Please welcome our host, Niall Gardner, Director of the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom and Bernard and Barbara Lomas Fellow. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Heritage Foundation. Welcome to our guests here in person, but also watching online on both sides uh, of the Atlantic. And it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, today the Right Honourable Oliver Dowden MP, Chairman of the UK Conservative Party and a senior member of the British uh, Cabinet. Uh, this morning, uh, Oliver will deliver remarks on the need for freedom-loving nations to be confident in themselves, stand up for their values, and not allow themselves to be divided by pernicious council culture activism. Uh, Mr. Dowden's remarks will be followed by a moderated discussion on a range of key pressing issues facing the United Kingdom uh, today. Uh, before being elected as the Conservative Member of Parliament for Hartsmere, Oliver Dowden served as a senior advisor to several Conservative leaders and Prime Ministers, most notably as Deputy Chief of Staff to Prime Minister David Cameron between 2010 and 2015. He was made a commander of the Order of the British Empire in recognition of his services. In 2018, Mr. Dowden was first appointed as a minister in Her Majesty's Government before being promoted to Cabinet, where he served as Paymaster General and as Minister for the Cabinet Office. In February 2020, he was appointed the Secretary of State for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport by Prime Minister Boris Johnson. During his tenure, he secured the largest ever one-off investment for the UK's world-renowned culture industry, supporting them through the pandemic and safeguarding them for future generations. In September 2021, Mr. Dowden was appointed Chairman of the Conservative Party. It's a great pleasure to welcome you today, Oliver, to the Heritage Foundation here in the heart of Washington, D.C. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Oliver Dowden. Thank you. For nearly half a century, heritage has been central to the revival of conservatism. It has always flown the flag for limited government, for free markets, and for individual responsibility. And as someone who grew up under Thatcher and Reagan, I am proud to say that those values shaped my politics. So it is a huge privilege to be here speaking to you as chairman of the Conservative Party, the oldest and most successful political party in the history of the democratic world. Uh, and the tireless work of institutions such as Heritage in promoting those values is becoming more important, not less. Today, a social media mob can cancel you merely because you have dared to challenge one of the left's fashionable nostrums. The enemies of the West are finding fresh confidence in their eternal battle against liberty. So conservatives themselves must find the confidence to mount a vigorous defense of the values of a free society. Margaret Thatcher understood this more than anyone. She spoke here as part of a lecture series to mark the 25th anniversary of your founding. As befits the Iron Lady of the Western world, courage was the theme of her address. In a speech that is really remarkable for its foresight, years before many had woken up to the fragility of the West's victory in the Cold War, she warned of a tendency of democracies to relax when the worst appears to be over. And today, while the US and the UK fulfill their obligations to NATO, others fail to do so. She warned that new dangers to the West were also being ignored. Now, that is certainly true for China. The idea that Beijing's partial embrace of free markets would automatically lead to greater social and personal political freedoms has proved to be breathtakingly naive. Finally, she noted, the importance of American leadership of the Western Alliance was in danger of being forgotten. So she was right to warn of the slackening of resolve following the Cold War. 
But some nations, thankfully, have managed to avoid it. The United Kingdom has made a point of showing its resolve. We have taken a tough stance on China's assault on democracy in Hong Kong and its outrageous abuses in Xinjiang province. As digital secretary, I banned Huawei from our 5G networks. Our prime minister recently agreed a landmark deal alongside the United States to supply Australia with nuclear submarines. And whilst others have wavered, we have provided practical support to Ukraine, including anti-tank missiles. The world watches the relationship between America and its allies. Not only must we stand together, we must be seen to stand together. But there's another dimension to this crisis affecting the West that she could not have foreseen. Rogue states are seeking to challenge the international order. And at the precise point when our resolve ought to be strongest, a pernicious new ideology is sweeping our societies. An ideology that if not confronted threatens to rob us of the self-confidence we need to uphold those very values. It goes by many names. In Britain, its adherents sometimes describe themselves as social justice warriors. They claim to be woke, awakened to the so-called truths of our societies. But wherever they are found, they pursue a common policy inimical to freedom. In their analysis, free speech is not a fundamental right necessary for the discovery of truth. To them, it is a dangerous weapon that should be curtailed to prevent harm. Free speech is hate speech is one of their more bizarre slogans. Each of us is accorded a level of privilege. That has nothing to do with our own personal struggles but is based on our membership of a particular group. So by their own shallow logic, as a man who went to Cambridge University and who now serves in the British cabinet, I'm a pinnacle of so-called privilege. It's apparently completely irrelevant to them that my parents were a shop worker and a factory worker who lost his job during a recession. If I'm privileged, it's because I have a loving family and enjoyed an excellent education at my local state community school. But to even question my supposed privilege is deemed to be proof of how privileged I am. Now, you might have noticed that woke warriors take a particular interest in history. Clearly, history is a living subject, one that will inevitably be revised. But these activists are not interested in real scholarship or nuance or in explaining the context of the bad things that our ancestors did alongside the good. They are engaged in a form of Maoism, determined to expunge large parts of our past in its entirety. For them, nothing is sacred. Winston Churchill was central to the Allied victory in a fight for survival against Nazi tyranny. Yet some seek to trash his whole reputation and deface monuments to him in wanton acts of iconoclastic fury. Now, it's tempting to assume that this onslaught can be passed off as a passing fad. That it's so ridiculous, so detached from what the majority think, and many have argued this, that it can simply be ignored. Universities from which so much of this unthinking re revisionism has emerged have, of course, for decades, been prey to left-wing excesses. There's always been a tendency among cultural and educational elites to serve their own interests rather than serve the public at large. And, of course, we conservatives have frequently confronted it. But this ideology is now everywhere. It's in our universities, but also in our schools, in government bodies, but also in corporations, in social science faculties, but also in the hard sciences. But I tell you, it is a 
dangerous form of decadence. Just when our attention should be focused on external foes, we seem to have entered this period of extreme introspection and self-criticism. And it really does threaten to sap our societies of their own self-confidence. Just when we should be showcasing the vitality of our values and the strength of democratic societies, we seem to be willing to abandon those values for the sake of appeasing this new groupthink. There are several interlinked dangers to all of this. To begin with, perhaps an obvious one. Those of us who grew up under Thatcher and Reagan, or indeed under Roosevelt and Churchill, were inspired by those leaders. But we also had an instinctive pride in our national story. A pride that joined even political opponents in a common sense of endeavor. But if they cease to be sources of pride, that unite diverse populations in a common understanding of who we are and what we stand for, then we lose that essential unity of purpose. And it's particularly striking that the two countries, the United Kingdom and the United States, where the woke agenda is pursued the most aggressively, those very same countries are also the countries where patriotism is most open and welcoming. Why on earth else would we be such magnets for migrants seeking to build a better life on our shores? In Britain, first, second and third generation migrants are among the most fervent champions of the countries that they have chosen to call their own home. Yet increasingly we are told that the pride they feel is somehow misplaced. Or even worse than that, and even more offensively, that their patriotism is some kind of false consciousness. Moreover, this woke ideology encourages a bizarre form of moral relativism. A view that Western nations are so compromised that they have no right to denounce the rogue states of today. For all their fury at so-called imperialism, these activists have absolutely nothing to say about Vladimir Putin's modern day empire building. Indeed, one of the perversities of this worldview is that the imperialist West is always at fault even if that is in standing up for a nation that has experienced the horrors of living under an actual evil empire in our own living memory. And yet, day by day, that worldview gains traction in elite circles. We risk a collapse in resolve. If all we hear is that our societies are monstrous, unjust, oppressive, why on earth would anyone fight to sustain them? It's a narrative that almost guarantees demoralization and despair. And of course, there is an opportunity cost of our irrational introspection. A West confident in its values would not be obsessing over pronouns or indeed seeking to decolonize mathematics. Now, you might say that's rather difficult when the numerals we use are actually Arabic, but I'll leave that to others to explain. It would be pointing out to would-be aggressors the strength of the values of a free society, even in the most desperate of circumstances. To the Hong Kongers, fighting for their rights in the face of extraordinary odds. To the people of Ukraine, determined that their nation should have the right to determine its own future. To the women of Afghanistan, prepared to defy Taliban rule, even at the risk of their own lives. Yet we allow ourselves to be obsessed by what divides us rather than what unites us. And it shouldn't just be conservatives 
who stand up for what made the West great. There was, of course, a time not very long ago when the mainstream left was just as committed to free speech as the right. Or when so-called liberals actually had something in common with those great champions of freedom, the likes of Gladstone and John Stuart Mill, who, both of whom, incidentally, are currently at risk of being cancelled. The UK joined NATO under a Labour Prime Minister. And when the left-wing parties were dominated by working people, rather than professional activists, they were just as patriotic as their conservative opponents. Sadly, the left has abandoned the field. Its leaders are either too weak to stand up for our own common values, or worse than that, they've embraced the doctrine of woke themselves. It seems that we conservatives must find the strength to, to defend the principles of free society on our own. So, our Conservative government in the United Kingdom is legislating to protect free speech on campus. We will stop the sinister phenomenon of academics or students who offend left-wing orthodoxies being censored or harassed. As culture secretary, I challenge those cultural institutions, those institutions funded by ordinary taxpayers, but which promoted politicized agendas. We have made it clear to schools that it is illegal to teach the concept of white privilege as though it were undisputed fact. And we must also not be frightened to expose the behavior of some corporate giants. And you know, all know the sort of corporations that I'm talking about. Ones that denounce perfectly legitimate efforts to reform electoral laws in democracies, whilst at the very same time keeping a profitable silence whilst flogging their goods to authoritarian regimes. We conservatives instead are on the side of people who believe that we are a force for good in the world. The US and the UK may certainly be very different societies, but we are joined by the same fundamental values. Neither of us can afford the luxury of indulging in this painful, woke psychodrama. It will take courage to resist it. Too many people have already fallen for the dismal argument that standing up for freedom is reactionary, or that somehow it's kind or virtuous to submit to these self-righteous dogmas. Well, it plainly is not. Instead, as Margaret Thatcher said to you almost 25 years ago, the task of conservatives is to remake the case for the West, to proclaim our beliefs in the wonderful creativity of the human spirit in the rights of property and the rule of law, and in the extraordinary fruitfulness of enterprise and trade. She refused to see the decline of the West as our inevitable destiny, and neither should we. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thanks very much for a tremendous speech. Uh, that was truly music to the ears, I think, of, of American conservatives, but also, of course, a, a speech that Lady Thatcher, I think, would have dearly uh, loved. And uh, Lady Thatcher established the, the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom here at Heritage back in 2005 in order to advance the US-UK special relationship, in order to shape thinking on both sides uh, of the Atlantic. Uh, and uh, as you outlined in your speech, you know, the culture wars are now front and center on uh, both sides of the Atlantic, actually. And you very eloquently outlined, I think, the, the powerful uh, case against cancel culture. And you spoke of the determination of the, the British government to stand up to the, uh, the far less nefarious woke agenda. Uh, and uh, you mentioned in your 
in your speech, uh, the measures that the British government uh, have taken to protect freedom of speech on, on British campuses. I think, um, you know, policies that will be closely watched here in the United States, where we're having this, the same uh, uh, debates. Could you also talk about the, uh, the measures that the British government is taking to protect historical statues and monuments? Uh, and um, just uh, a few months ago, uh, the Prime Minister uh, weighed into the, the debate over uh, the Sasser Road statue at Oriel College, which happens to be my old college at Oxford. Uh, and the Prime Minister strongly stood up for the defence of, of British history, for the defence of Britain's past, and called on Britons to take tremendous pride in the nation. And opinion polls have shown uh, that the vast majority of Britons do take tremendous pride in, their, in the history. Could you um, discuss uh, a bit uh, the, the measures that your government uh, are taking now to protect Britain's heritage and, and history and culture? Yes, well, I'd, I'd be delighted to. And I think you're absolutely right that um, the vast majority of Britons, and by the way, contrary to what the left like to claim, in a recent poll, I believe about 90% of black Britons also shared the view that we should be standing up for our country and be against tearing down statues. So what we've said in respect of statues is, first of all, we've increased the penalties for wanton criminal damage. Secondly, we are enhancing the planning laws to provide uh, appropriate uh, protection. But I think if you take something like Cecil Rhodes, it's a great example of it. Many people have walked past Oriel College. I doubt that most people had noticed this statue. It's one that's sort of right up in, uh, you will remember it well, in a sort of alcove above the entrance. So that, first of all, the left takes something and turn it into an object of division where, when it wasn't that in the first place. And then secondly, rather than exploring the complex history of, of Cecil Rhodes, and I'm not for a moment um, saying that I'm a defender of everything that, that Cecil Rhodes did, far from it, but I think the correct response of strong and confident nations is to embrace our past, to both say our past can be our past, but also to say, let's use these things as a way of understanding our past better. That's why, as Culture Secretary, I instituted a policy which we applied to all the cultural institutions which we, we funded in the United Kingdom, or certainly in England as, as Culture Secretary. Uh, as you might imagine, that's many thousands of them, basically of retain and explain. So we said, if you're receiving money from taxpayers, why is it ultimately that a granny in a flat in Middlesbrough is willing for her taxes to go to fund cultural institutions, because essentially we're trying to preserve something that is precious from our past for future generations to, to enjoy it. And those institutions should be mindful of the taxpayers that pay for it, and if they wish to continue receiving funding, then they should make sure that they retain the things that they are funded to retain, but they should also be using it as a way of explaining our rich history. And I think that's the, the correct approach to pursue. And uh, also on, on the subject of the, the cultural wars, um, on this side of the Atlantic, the issue of critical race theory has been fundamentally important. And uh, it was, in fact, the, the key issue in the recent uh, governor's race in, in Virginia. Uh, and uh, the, the fact that conservatives took a very strong stance against CRT was a key factor in overturning a 10-point you know, lead that the Democrats had from uh, from, from the presidential uh, race. And um, the issue of critical race theory in schools, how big an issue is this in, in the UK? What is the, the British government doing uh, in terms of uh, you know, combating uh, CRT? Well, I think we see this trend on both sides of the, the Atlantic. Um, it is not a major issue in British schools at the moment, but we are increasingly seeing signs of it. There was, um, there was a case in Brighton recently. And I think it's... This, this is um, very important that we, we get this right. Uh, for me, it's essential that um, we have an understanding um, of our history and of our past. And of course, all British people, by and large, are passionately anti-racist. But to take some of this critical race theory, I think it does two things. It creates divisions where there were not divisions in the, the first place. And I think that's particularly worrying in, in, in primary schools. But I think also what it does is it moves from a wholly correct um, 
disgust at racism to saying somehow that our societies have become or are systematically racist and that the enlightenment values that we believe in as a society, um, democracy, free speech, rule of law, open capital societies that, by the way, have made us so rich and prosperous and have attracted people from around the world to come and live in uh, Britain and America, are somehow intertwined uh, with this, uh, this racism and in themselves are racist constructs. It's a sort of eating away the fundamental beliefs that have made us such great countries to live and work in. And I think that is, that is why it's essential that we counter this. Yeah, well, well said. I mean, I think that Britain is one of the uh, least racist nations on, on earth uh, and a nation that, that stands for the freedom and liberty of, of all. It's not, and I see this in my, both in the United Kingdom and my own constituency. It's wonderful that we are such an open and welcoming society. I have a massive and uh, growing British Indian Hindu community. In previous generations, we have a, a, a large and growing Jewish community, many of whom escape persecution elsewhere. People come generation after generation to the United Kingdom and the United States to seek that freedom and protection. And for that, in turn, to be characterized as some kind of racist construct is, is perverse. Exactly. And, uh, and switching uh, to the, the arena of uh, foreign policy, uh, and um, the news at the moment, of course, on both sides of the Atlantic is dominated by the, the Russia-Ukraine uh, crisis. Uh, the United Kingdom has really been at the forefront of standing up to the Russian bear. In marked contrast to, it has to be said, the, the rather weak-kneed approach of the, the European Union and many uh, key European uh, countries, including, uh, for example, uh, Germany. Uh, the Germans have uh, been uh, heavily criticized actually by the Ukrainian uh, government with regard to their refusal to send uh, defensive weapons to Ukraine to defend themselves against the Russians. And uh, Europe seems to be very deeply divided over this issue. And so many European countries are heavily dependent upon Russian energy supplies, energy, Russian gas. Um, whereas the British government, the Brexit British government, has been by far the most robust in standing up to the, to the Russians. Could you talk about British leadership on the Ukraine crisis and also the, the resurgence of uh, you know, British leadership on the, on the world stage in the Brexit era? How important is Brexit actually to, to British leadership right now? I think it's an important question, and, uh, and I, I'd say two things. First of all, contrary to the, the scaremongering that, that was put about, particularly in the immediate period after the British people voted to, to leave the European Union, that somehow Britain leaving the European Union would lead to us withdrawing from the, the world stage, actually you've seen the contrary, and you've seen Prime Minister Boris Johnson working alongside um, the President of the United States and others in taking a very a uh, robust stance uh, against Russian aggression in Ukraine. And by the way, you're right to point out, it, it extends beyond warm words to actually the kind of practical support in terms of providing that uh, defensive military assistance in, in the way that you describe. Again, as a result of us putting the kind of investment into our armed forces that it appears that uh, the United Kingdom, the United States, and very few other countries are willing to do so in, 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 in this era. But more than that, I, I detect um, both an interest in the United Kingdom on the, the world stage again, and uh, a British uh, assertiveness and engagement in the world stage, which is where the United Kingdom, is, as you know now better than most people, that's where we feel most comfortable as a nation. Absolutely, and uh, I do think it's striking that there is this tremendous self-confidence in Britain's approach right now, uh, whereas you know, if you look across much of Europe, especially in Western Europe, there is a lack of self-confidence that's, that's there. Uh, Deep-seated uh, divisions and also a sense of decline, I think, within the European Union. Uh, and uh, the decision by the British people to, uh, to leave the EU in 2016 in the historic referendum was a tremendous uh, decision in favor of sovereignty, self-determination, uh, in favor of, of freedom. And we're now seeing the, the results of that on the on the international stage with British leadership on, 
uh, on the Ukraine crisis. And, and here in Washington, where uh, you have a lot of, I would say, Brexit skeptics within the sort of foreign policy establishment, especially within uh, you know, the Biden uh, administration and some of the think tanks that, that are close to it. Uh, but um, it is striking how, how many in the US foreign policy establishment are now uh, acknowledging that actually Brexit uh, was, was a very good thing, actually, for, for British leadership in the world, good for the special relationship, uh, and is uh, strengthening the hand of those who are fighting against uh, totalitarian regimes and, and dictatorships. And on that note, a question on uh, China. And you spoke about uh, the measures the British government have, have taken to stand up to the Chinese threat. Uh, you were culture secretary when the UK made the decision to strip Huawei out of the UK's telecommunications networks. A big move, a big decision, a game changer in many respects uh, that really reversed uh, decades of decision making by previous British administrations. Uh, could you talk a bit more about the Huawei decision and about the determination of the British government to, to stand up to China as an adversary? Uh, Yes, and I think it's, it's a, an area of um, growing importance. Uh, I would say, first of all, by the way, that in respect of um, China, uh, I and it is the position of the British government believe in the open rules-based system for the international order. And for, for uh, I very much welcome uh, trade and engagement with China if China is willing to play uh, by the rules of international law. Now, sadly, there have been uh, recent incidents where we have just had to call this out. And I think in the past, there's been a reluctance uh, for, for Western governments, including the, the, the UK government, to properly call out some of this stuff. So just take three examples. The, the appalling human rights uh, abuses that are now happening in Hong Kong in terms of abrogating our, our treaty responsibility, the, 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 the treaty that was agreed when Hong Kong was handed over. The, there seems to be a lack of respect for, for many aspects of that, and you, we've seen the kind of crackdown on democratic values that is happening in uh, Hong Kong. Secondly, we've seen it in um, uh, Xinjiang province, and again, I, this is something, going back to my opening remarks, I find extraordinary the, the, the willingness of many on the left to, to call out failings uh, in our own countries, in the United States and uh, the UK, but uh, a deafening silence when it comes to grotesque abuses happening in, in, in Xinjiang province. But also, I think, in respect to our national security, we need to take a clear-eyed view of what's in the, the best interest of our national security. And ultimately, the judgment that I took as Culture Secretary, clearly with responsibility for the digital economy as well, uh, working with the, the Prime Minister, uh, and others, was that particularly in the light of the sanctions that were imposed by President Trump on Huawei, that it was no longer in the national security interests of the United Kingdom to have Huawei in our, our networks. And I think that this is not, uh, I'm really not anti-Chinese, but I, I think we have to be clear-eyed in standing up both for our values and for our national security. An extremely important uh, point there. Uh, and um, switching uh, now, um, Oliver, to the, the future of the, the Conservative uh, Party, and the, the Prime Minister has been under very heavy fire recently in the wake of the, the Partygate uh, scandal. Uh, and has, it has dominated, of course, a lot of the, the headlines in the UK over the past uh, few, the few weeks. Um, the Prime Minister has also, of course, uh, made it very clear that he will uh, fight to, to remain as, as the Prime Minister. Uh, and he has been absolutely adamant in, in making that, that clear. Could you talk a bit about uh, the, the Prime Minister's uh, determination to uh, to uh, continue leading the British people at, at this time uh, and, uh, and how, how the Conservative Party is going to move forward from what has been a, a very, very difficult time for the party in the past few weeks and may continue to be a difficult time for, for, uh, for some time to, to come as well. Well, well, I won't bore people in this, this room and in the, the, the US with, with further details of... Um, 
uh, the the what, what you described as, as as party gate suffice to say the prime minister has given a very clear explanation to parliament and there's ongoing uh, investigations but what i think is uh, important and i see this coming through more and more is there is a real recognition that the uk government led by uh, our prime minister made three really big calls and got them right so we promised to deliver Brexit, with a, which the British people voted for, but have been stuck in logjam for about three or four years. We got on and we did that. Secondly, we made a big call and made a massive investment in the vaccine programme, which meant that we had the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe, not once, twice, but now three times with the booster programme, which gave rise to the, the third challenge. And there was, and there was an awful lot of pressure. Uh, particularly before Christmas, for the UK government to impose further restrictions on people's liberties and freedoms in the name of guarding against COVID. But because we had made that investment in the, the vaccine programme, the Prime Minister was able to resist that and ensure that we kept our economy open. And we are now reaping the benefits of that with the fastest growth in the, the, the G7. And I think actually it's those kind of big calls on dealing with COVID that we've got right. The challenge for us now is how we deal with the consequences of COVID. And those are profound, whether that's in the kind of inflationary pressure that we're seeing um, through supply chains feeding through to the economy and cost of living, or whether that's the consequences for our, our health service of massive COVID backlogs. We need to make sure we focus on dealing with those challenges. And that's the, those are the fundamental issues that the Conservative Party has to get right to actually take that strength and deal with the consequences of COVID. There have been um, uh, growing calls, uh, I would say, within the conservative uh, grassroots in the United Kingdom and also among many uh, backbenchers for, uh, for the Conservative Party to adopt uh, a, or return to a, a more sort of Thatcherite agenda, uh, limited government, uh, lower, lower taxes. Um, there have been, uh, I think, calls for the British government to, um, you know, to really return to its sort of ideological uh, roots and also, of course, calls for uh, tougher immigration policies as well. And it has to be said, it doesn't help that the French have been sort of exporting illegal migrants across the channel now for, for many, many months and have been doing their best to undermine uh, the, uh, the British government at every, at every opportunity, especially in the Brexit era. Uh, and... Um, could you talk a bit about the, you know, the future direction of, of the Conservative Party and the enduring importance of Margaret Thatcher's ideas, ideology, her, her principles for, uh, for, for Conservative leaders today? Well, look, I, I'm unashamedly uh, a child of Thatcher, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why, and why I think it has relevance to uh, British politics to today. First of all, I, I came from a very ordinary background in the, the way that uh, you know, I, I described in my speech in passing. And for me, Margaret Thatcher, as a person that truly embodied that sense of aspiration and hard work and getting on in your life in order to provide for yourself and your family and ultimately your community and your country, she was the embodiment of that. You know, it's, it's very hard now to think back to quite how revolutionary it was the way that Margaret Thatcher, from her sort of background and as a woman, came both to lead the Conservative Party, but then to change the direction of the United Kingdom in a massively positive way. So for me, the sense of hard work and aspiration is at the root of conservatism. So that's, that's the, the first lesson. But the other thing for me is that she articulated basic true conservative uh, beliefs. For example, who knows best how to spend your own money? Is it you or the state? And for all that the state has achieved during uh, the response to COVID, it has left me more profound in my belief that we as individuals know how best to spend our own money. About living within our means, and many of you will remember how Margaret Thatcher compared it to a, a grocer's um, shopping basket, a shopping basket of groceries. But it, it's, it's those basic conservative beliefs. And in the end, I think that then translates through to where we are with, with taxation and the, the size of the economy. It has to be the, the case. And I think you've, you hear this increasingly from conservative ministers, and you hear it from the prime minister and the chancellor, that we have reached a high watermark of the size of the, the state. Now, there's an inevitability when one's dealing with a crisis that 
you have an expansion in the size of the state. But we can't repeat the mistakes that we've seen in the past, whereby in previous national crises, the state has expanded in scope and then has remained permanently much larger. We now need to embark on the course of making sure we rein in the size of the state, which in turn allows us to cut taxes, meaning that people can keep more of their own money and decide how to spend it themselves. Those are basic conservative principles, and I think you will see a return to those over the coming uh, years from the government. And um, you're uh, here in Washington at the moment, uh, and uh, you're um, undertaking a series of meetings with uh, you know, policy makers and, and strategic thinkers here in, here in DC. And I think this is actually the first uh, speech in uh, Washington by a Conservative Party chairman over, over 20, 20 years. Um, do you see uh, the uh, see what, what the British Conservative government is doing at, at the moment as influential here in, in the United States in terms of shaping perhaps some of the thinking on you know the culture wars agenda, uh, some of the thinking on COVID. After all, um, you know the, the British government is the most powerful conservative administration in the world right now, and it's also the first major country in the world, I think, large-scale nation to almost completely eradicate all COVID uh, restrictions. And I believe from uh, from March, they will be completely eliminated altogether. Whereas here in the United States, of course, uh, many US cities, especially those run by the Democrats, are, are still stuck in a sort of pandemic mindset with all sorts of mass mandates, vaccine, uh, you know, passport agendas and so on. And Washington's a very good example of, of that. Uh, do you think that, um, you know, what, what Britain is doing right now is, is an example for, for the United States uh, to follow on, on several fronts? Well, I, I should say that as conservatives and as a conservative government, we are freedom loving. And it, for me, probably the hardest thing uh, I've had to do as a minister, and I hope the hardest thing I've ever had to do is to be involved in the kind of discussions where we're imposing such terrible restrictions on people's liberties. And I've always been of the view, and I know the Prime Minister has been of the view, that we should have restrictions for as minimal as possible for the shortest possible period of time. And I think it's fantastic that the United Kingdom is now at the leader of the, the pack around the world in returning people's liberties, learning to live with COVID, and hopefully, as you say, by the end of March, we'll have removed uh, all the remaining additional COVID restrictions that we had to impose. That's important both for people's liberties, but it's also important for people's mental health and well-being. It's important for the economy. We have to properly understand the kind of cost that's been imposed by these measures and the need to remove them as quickly as, as, as we possibly can. And I'm delighted that we've been able to do that. Well, I have to say, I mean, the, the leadership that Britain has shown on the COVID issue has been absolutely outstanding. Uh, and um, we're nearly out of time, but a, a last question with regard to the US-UK special relationship uh, and its, its fundamental importance, of course, to uh, both uh, the US and the UK, the beating heart of the free world in, in many respects. Um, could you talk about the... Um, uh, the, the vision that uh, you know, the Prime Minister has for, for the future of the US-UK special relationship, how important is that going to be in terms of, of helping to shape British policy uh, in the Brexit era? Well, for, for every um, Prime Minister since the, the Second World War, pretty much the, the UK-US relationship is our most important strategic uh, relationship. I think what you're seeing post-Brexit is that we can pursue that with renewed vigour, and I think the Prime Minister is very strongly committed to that. I think you can see it, as I would say you often see the case, that when it comes to the actual hard decisions in terms of supporting freedom and those values uh, that are key to the US-UK relationship, the UK steps forward, and you've seen that in, in respect of uh, the Ukraine in defence of those values, and I know the Prime Minister is, is passionately committed to doing that. And I actually think there are huge opportunities for us going forward. If you take one area that I used to be responsible in terms of the digital and the, the tech economy, I think that the opportunities for the UK and the US to, to collaborate that through collaborate on that through uh, further free trade agreements are enormous in a way that will massively benefit both of our countries. And I think there's actually 
an openness to doing that kind of thing, which previously, when we were a part of the EU, would have had to have been negotiated through an endless period of uh, discussion, agreement with other members of the EU, probably watered down to the lowest common denominator. The UK actually has a flexibility now to pursue things that are in it, its national interest, but also in the national interests of the United States. And I think that you will find more and more of that level of uh, sincere engagement in a way that is mutually beneficial to both our countries. And I think I'm certainly looking forward to a, a renewed period of UK-US engagement for the benefit of both of our nations. And I think it's a tremendously optimistic time to be in politics. Well, Oliver Dowden, th thanks very much for a, a tremendous uh, speech and uh, a very enlightening uh, discussion here today at a very important time, I think, for, for British leadership on the international stage, an important time as well for uh, British conservative uh, leadership also. Uh, and uh, I very much hope that you will uh, return to uh, the heritage in, in the near future. Uh, it's been a tremendous uh, pleasure to host you uh, this, this morning. Uh, and I, I think it's been an absolutely uh, superb uh, discussion. Uh, and um, we very much hope to welcome yourself and your team back to Heritage as, as, soon, as, uh, as soon as possible. And, uh, and a big thank you to everyone who's joined us uh, both here in, in Washington in person, but also watching uh, online uh, in both the United States and the United Kingdom and also in, in Europe as well. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. We look forward to uh, welcoming you back uh, to Heritage for... Uh, for future events here, and uh, it's great to see everyone today. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oliver Darden. Thank you. Pleasure.